Okay, great. Looks good. Okay, so now we are going to get into our session agenda. So um, for the first section, we're going to talk about, we're going to explore some of the challenges and opportunities associated with conducting research in partnership with Indigenous populations. And then in the second section, um, we'll talk about the role of partnerships in supporting the co-creation of knowledge. Um, so for this first section, as we kind of dig into section one, we'll start off with really understanding race, ethnicity, and culture. Um, first, we, we want to start with culture, um, as that is our kind of foundation for all of our work. And we have to understand that um, culture consists of a symbolic system of values, traditions, social and political relationships, and worldviews created, shared, and transformed by a group of people bound together by common history, geographic location, language, social class, religion, or other shared identity. And that culture is passed down from generation to generation and changes over time. It is dynamic. Um, and we can't talk about this without talking about race and racialized language. Um, race in the u.s is a social and political reality it has if it wasn't clear before it's very clear now um, race groups are genetic fictions and social realities and i'm glad that i can say this today and it's not as surprising as saying it a year ago was um, decisions about whom to marry and date where to live where to go to school what's taught how to move about one's community and surrounding area, where to shop, for whom to vote, and what occupation to pursue are all consciously or unconsciously influenced by racial considerations. And, and this is all grounded in a sociological perspective. So there, for a very long time, like I said, even a year ago, I feel like it was more surprising to hear about race as being a sociological perspective rather than a scientific perspective. Um, but we know that historically people have expressed this belief that race is natural, that, it, that racial differences are inborn. DNA research actually shows that there are likely to be more physical differences between people of the same race than between two people of different races. So, Scientists can't define the broad racial categories we often relate to, um, attributes such as skin color, facial features, hair color and texture, and other physical aspects of human beings. And despite the scientific repudiation of race as a viable category, people are still tied to these perceptions of race as an aspect of identity. Um, in colonial America, for example, there were laws referred to Negroes, referred to Negroes, whites, and Indians beginning in the 1600s. Those definitions of race have painted whites as naturally superior members of other racial and other racial groups as inferior. These claims, often combined with views of religious and cultural superiority, were used to justify enslaving Africans, assimilating American Indians, and bestowing land and the fruits of other people's labors to whites. Race has become metaphorical, a way of referring to and disguising forces, events, classes, and expressions of social decay and economic division far more threatening to society than biological race ever was since Toni Morrison in 1992. Racial labels can be codes to imply that someone is powerful, poor, dangerous, or oppressing. Now, identity is complex and racialized language is never accurate. We use it throughout this presentation. We use it throughout um, our, our work and it's never accurate and it's always problematic. Um, when referring to people who are indigenous to, to North America, there are many terms used, and I'll even say to the continent that is labeled North America, 
um, American Indian, American Indian, Alaska Native, Indigenous Peoples, Native American, First Nations, Tribal Member, Native. Each of these terms carry, um, they, they each carry a different history and interpretation. American Indian um, or Indian are the terms generally used by the federal government. Um, and they, of course, refer back to the late 15th century when Columbus thought he had arrived in Eastern Asia. Native American became an alternate alternative to these terms, but was never adopted by the federal government. And some indigenous scholars, such as Dr. Michael Yellowbird, have rejected both American Indian and Native American as oppressive and counterfeit identities, preferring the terms indigenous peoples or First Nations. But there are so many different perspectives on this, which is why I like to show the next video. And Chelsea, um, hopefully, <laughs> has much of a problem sharing this video as the last. Maybe it'll work better this time. Um, and we'll, this is another piece by the New York Times that talks about this from different people's perspectives. And I hope that you can see the different, um, different ways that people think of this and why there is a no correct term here because again we're using racialized language and anytime you use racialized language it will always be problematic we always say when you're working with i'll stop sharing my screen just so you can get that started but um, while you're doing that i'll say that it's um we always say that when you're working in a community that you use the language of that community so if i'm working with bay mills i refer to to that community is Bay Mills, right? Or I refer to, if I'm working in Michigan, we tend to talk about Anishinaabe, right? Um, but when you're working on a national project like this, the data set that we're gonna be talking about later, we can't use the names of the particular groups that we're working with because the communities are de-identified purposely and importantly so. It's, very important that that is the case. Um, but it also means that, that we have to use these problematic terms um, and just use whichever one seems to be the best. So go ahead, Chelsea, I'm sorry. You don't hear the audio, do you? No, we sure didn't. Okay. Oh, I, I think I know why. Yeah, sometimes you have to select that button. I'm Apache, but really that's the, the government's name because they can't say They will tell me how awesome they think it is that I've decided to be a part of my culture. And it's funny to me, I'll, I'll, it like hits me really weird and I don't like it and I didn't know why at first, but it's because I haven't decided to be a part of my culture, I live it every day. I'm more comfortable with the term native, divorced from Native American. Um, I know there are people who use indigenous, and I, I, there, if there is one term I do not like to be called is American Indian. And for me, to be indigenous is to have an intimate and interconnected relationship to a homeland. And so that's really important because land is, you know, tied to every aspect of who we are. Being, being native in a city, um, is, is almost a daily reminder of, of your people's erasure, of the fact that people don't even remember that you're here and that you exist. But what I did encounter was just this preconceived notion that all Native Americans are dead. I've had a older white men come up to me and say, oh man, if this was 40 years ago, I can just do whatever I wanted to you. You know, the cattle outside doing the work and the dog inside the house, those are 
property. Those are the black folks in America. They're our property to white men. Then the exotic antelope on the wall or the exotic, you know, that's the native, that's how natives are perceived in America. We're treated like animals. They're, they monitor our blood quantum. We're the only, I mean, besides dogs and horses, I don't know of any other animal that they monitor the blood quantum. The way I explain it to people is like, imagine a pizza with different slices and let's say 32 slices. Of the 32 slices, I'm 28 Apache. That's my particular blood quantum. And Native Americans in the U.S. are the only minority group who have to prove their nativeness on an Indian card. It's used to divide Native people against each other because it can be used as a way to say, I am more Native than you. And I was a part of that too. I used my four-fourths to kind of make myself feel better against other people. The one drop rule meaning that, you know, one drop of black blood makes you black, you know, that was to keep as many people oppressed or, you know, legitimize their oppression um, as possible. But on the other side, one drop of anything else completely dilutes you as, an, as a native person. So if you're a native person, you have a one drop of something else, then suddenly you're less native. So it's the opposite. Traditionally, Within the Apache society, you go by the mother. And if the mother's recognized as Apache, she has her clan, uh, the children are unquestionably Apache. Not in the American context, not when patriarchy trumps matriarchy. So what does that mean? My sisters are short 1 16th of a degree. What does that mean? Does that mean their pinkies aren't Apache? What does that mean? You know, being a mixed race person is a whole another side of it, but that's a very common experience in our tribe. So it's not as if we're unusual in that way. What is unusual is the admixture of black. My grandfather actually doesn't want people, if he, if he hears that somebody from the tribe is coming over, he won't come out of his room because he doesn't want them to know that He's that complexion that he doesn't, I guess he doesn't want me to be affiliated with, with having African-American blood, but I mean, I say it, it it's not going to change anything. If it were up to the American government, natives wouldn't be around because after a certain time, that blood will dilute, it will go out. And so if there's no native peoples to provide benefits, then we're not obligated to meet these treaty rights. And if we're not obligated to meet these treaty contracts, then the land is available. The resources are available. And I think that that, that essential point about our claim to sovereignty, our claim to land, our claim to a culture, our claim to resources is one that gets lost if we, if we don't insist upon the fact that we are nations. And we have taken huge steps to decolonizing. And that's, that proof comes from people being able to have the opportunities to speak their language, to be on their ancestral land. But the thing with decolonization is, is that it's, it's an ongoing process, just like grieving, just like any loss. As much as possible now, I try to tell people that I have a Native American name and maybe it doesn't mean anything to you, but it means everything to me. My name maybe doesn't have a romanticized Hollywood Indian name, but my name has more meaning than that. My name means that my family survived. My family survived disease. My family survived Catholicism. My family survived settler colonialism, colonism, and my family, they survived. I survived. My existence is resistance. Me saying my name is Skiam Tolks, that is resistance in and of itself. There's another video that I love and makes me emotional every time I see it. It doesn't change how many times I see it, um, that it brings up all those emotions. It's powerful. And hearing people describe from their own words, <laughs> Um, their experiences, I think, is part of that power. So thank you for taking the time to watch that with us. Um, and thanks for sharing that, Chelsea.
So um, I, I'm probably going to say this again later. I'm sure I do, in fact. Um, but American Indian and Alaska Native children live in communities that are rich in traditional heritage, cultural life ways, and kinship connections that have promoted health and resilience for generations. And you just heard talking about survival, and that's where survival comes from, the strength to survive in the face of all that has happened. Despite this, um, this all these rich cultural strengths, um, American- Just real quick, Jessica. Yeah. We don't see your slides. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to share that. Okay, so share screen. I appreciate you letting me know. Okay. All right. They're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, you know, in, in spite of all these rich cultural strengths, American Indian Alaska Native children are at high risk for negative social health and academic outcomes. And we know it's because it even, you know, surviving, surviving these experiences, um, what we call historical trauma or what some people call historical trauma is at the heart or at the root of all, all of this. And so um, these higher risks are likely due to family and intergenerational effects, as well as societal policies and practices that continue to promote inequities for children of color in the United States. Both of these causes are amplified by the degradation of culturally grounded practices in communities. To better understand the oppression experiences of American and Alaska Native communities, an examination of formal schooling, starting with the boarding school era, shows that once white society decided to expand westward, Native people basically had two choices, assimilation or extinction. White society had created educational experiences or boarding schools outside of and often incredibly far away from their communities due to the belief that residing in, on their native homelands had resulted in uncivilized systems, structures, and cultural ways. As off-reservation boarding schools were established, the plan was to remove Indian children from all outside influences and contact with the tribe, which is positively necessary in order to teach them morality, to quote. Remnants of this educational and life experience legacy centered on Pratt's or similar ideologies can be felt and seen across indigenous communities today. Historical trauma resulting from loss and grieving of the loss associated with generations of forced assimilation, acculturation, and removing children for civilized schooling help explain some of the extreme circumstances and conditions that are present today. Um, now, here is a talk. I'm going to try to be mindful of our time. Um, I, I think I'll probably post this video in the chat for you all to watch. I think it's a great, great video um, about historical trauma and resilience. Um, and it's a, but it's a little bit longer. So I want to make sure that you have time to see it and we can get through our slides. So I will post the link to this um, video to you all once, um, once I'm on a break and able to do that. Um, but it's a great video. And the way she flips around Brock and Brenner's um, model uh, is, is brilliant. And so anyways, I encourage all of you to watch that and we will, I'll share that with you. So I wanted, I'm super excited to hear that you talked about data sovereignty yesterday. That's awesome. I wanted to put just a little bit in about it here and we don't have a whole lot. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later as well. We'll try to tie it into practice and how you do this work. But data sovereignty is the right of a nation to own and control data through laws and governance structures. Uh, it's about who can gather data, who owns the data and how those data are used it's an extension, data sovereignty is an extension of tribes' right to govern their people's lands and resources. Um, and so now we're gonna shift over to examining research from a cultural lens. And within this, I like to talk about culturally sensitive and culturally grounded approaches to research. There are two distinct notions. 
I like to think of them as both existing on a spectrum. And thanks, Michelle. So Michelle posted that the YouTube video in the in the chat. So awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and so culturally sensitive research is research that is responsive to the unique cultural context of the community. You're conducting yourself in a way that is culturally sensitive. You're understanding how to do your work um, in a way that is, again, kind of responsive to the people that you're working with, the unique needs and their unique strengths. Um, culturally grounded research is different in that the unique cultural context of the community is the foundation of the work. And that's different. And you can have a research study that is culturally sensitive, but not culturally grounded. <laughs> and you can also have um, a study that is both culturally sensitive and culturally grounded, right? So it really is this continuum. And you're not always able to have culturally grounded I, I, I think you should always strive for cultural sensitivity and when possible, cultural grounding. Um, and again, it's a spectrum. It's not, it's culturally grounded or not culturally grounded. You can have a range of how culturally grounded you are as well as cultural sensitivity. Um, so some conceptual frameworks that support culturally um, sensitive and culturally grounded research um, are what we're gonna talk about next. Um, and there are some, I, I think this is really important and foundational, and I see people asking about the slides, absolutely, but I am happy to share them, um, and we'll do that after, after this. So the first kind of conceptual framework that I want to talk about is anti-racism research, and, um, and we can approach community-based participatory research from an anti-racism stance, and some of the concepts that are useful in community-based participatory research include how our own personal histories and experiences shape how we understand and interpret the world, how knowledge that is produced through research impacts our personal and collective identities, how the institutions we work for and with privilege traditional forms of research and inappropriately use standards that were designed for traditional models when assessing the value of other kinds of knowledge and how critical self-interrogation of one's own values should be an ongoing activity. Um, and so this is coming, the reference here is uh, the foundation for that, um, but it's really an approach that recognizes these power differentials and relationships and the privilege that comes with particular racial identities and works to explicitly name these issues and work, work together on those. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, tribal crit. Um, it's stemming from or related to um, critical race theory. Um, is, and this is a quote, I'll just read this quote. <laughs> CRT and tribal crit are useful tools in telling the stories of historical and contemporary issues affecting indigenous peoples among those complex intersections. The this facilitates the examination of whiteness as property, which interrogates white privilege and dislocates the normative of whiteness. Colonization is disrupted, allowing for the reclaiming and recentering of ind indigenous knowledges, experiences, and perspectives. Um, decolonization is the process where indigenous people whose community um, were severely affected by colonial expansion, genocide, and cultural assimilation, as we've been talking about here, uh, recover power by reclaiming that indigeneity. And we heard people talking about that in the video that we just watched. It's, it's um, super important. And there are other readings uh, by Brian Brayboy that are really great and give a really good, clear description of tribe crit that we can post to. Um, so, I talked just a little bit about um, decolonizing, de I'm not going to say that right now, <laughs> lack of sleep means my tongue doesn't always work, so um, coloniality encompasses the ongoing material and psychological effects of living in a global system created through colonial processes. 
And when we decolonize, since I can say that, I'll, I'll shift over to using that language. Um, thanks, Michelle, for posting the Brave Boy article. It's a great one. Is an approach that examined, examines how colonization, settler colonialism, racial capitalism, modernity, and neoliberalism shape contemporary contexts in our understanding of concepts such as what it means to have healthy relationships with family and the environment. When we decolonize, it is not a single action, idea, or method. Rather, it is a commitment to and paradigm of restoration and reparation that depends on context, historical conditions, and geography. And I want to, I wish I could like make in big words, just like sparkle at you or something. Um, this paradigm, because I feel like so much of doing this work, it involves huge paradigm shifts that we um, encounter along our way. So um, I want to talk a little bit about indigenous, really, really briefly, indigenous research methods and approaches. And, um, and, and this is coming, what we're talking about right now is coming from work by Sean Wilson of kind of the phases of approaches and moving from very traditionalist research um, methodology and approaches all the way to going from assimilationist to decolonizing to autonomous indigenous. And as we're doing this work, when we are working on kind of having this more indigenous grounding in our research methodology and approaches, is that we're asking these fundamental questions. What is knowledge? Who defines it? Who, who is getting to interact with it? And how do we think of knowledge? Do we think of knowledge as a living, breathing entity? Or do we think of knowledge as something that we can own and control and take power of? And we can ask those same questions about land and about who we are, our own identities. And when we begin to ask those questions, we begin to focus more on relationships. And those relationships are critical. They're critical for this indigenous research methodology approaches. They're also critical for understanding how we move forward in community-based participatory research too. And when we look at it, it all comes down to our worldview. And again, these paradigm shifts of moving from thinking of the world in these ecosystem approaches where you know it's egocentric, there's a hierarchy of, of value of life in general, and there's a hierarchy of human value to more of an ecosystem where we're understanding our rela relationships across. And that is super important. Now, there are some people who've done some really, really interesting work and we won't describe it too much, but I just wanted to introduce it so you can look into it more because it's really cool stuff. Um, but Marsh and colleagues have developed this research process through the medicine wheel that I think is absolutely beautiful and encourage you to look into this and how you can conceptualize research through this process of the medicine wheel. Now note that the medicine wheel isn't ubiquitous across native communities, as we've already talked about, but many native communities do have the medicine wheel and is appropriate depending on the community that you are working within. Now, um, the roles of partnerships in supporting the co-creation knowledge, the second section um, is what we'll go through next. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what engaged research is. I have a feeling you've probably talked about a little bit about this already. But these participatory approaches to research, uh, there are so many labels for this. Uh, I won't try to describe them all because there are so many. The three that I tend to use the most are community-based participatory re research or CBPR, participatory action research, which then includes like um, the focus on the action part and what you do with that information that you gather together and tribal participatory research. And so a real basic definition by Barbara Israel around community engaged research, and this is focused on health research, but it applies in many aspects of community-based participatory research or CBPR in many disciplines, but it's a collaborative form of inquiry based on equity and partnerships in that research process that focuses on the strengths of individuals and communities to promote community action and social change. 
I love that definition. And so I always use it. Um, so I, I probably don't have to tell you all this. Why should we involve community research? Well, because we develop a better understanding of the conditions, factors, and strengths within communities when we involve community in our research. We also develop deeper and richer scientific understandings. The fact that, uh, that when we work together to engage in our research, we um, are able to co-create or, or um, develop stronger understandings of knowledge and that again gives us these really deeper and richer scientific understandings. So much of what we think we understand today, I think, is lacking because of this approach. What are you doing? That's just me. Other people are not up with it. Um, so, how should we involve community in research? And um, so we'll be wrapping this up fairly quickly. So, I think we're actually going to be close to being on time. Um, so we have principles of community-based participatory research, and these are kind of the primary principles that have been proposed by Barbara Israel and her colleagues over the years, and they're all very important. Um, I also want to talk about what Minkler and Wallerstein and their colleagues have added to those principles, and I love these three. Um, because I think they really get at the heart of what we do. It involves this long-term process and commitment to sustainability. It openly addresses issues of race, ethnicity, racism, and social class, and really embodies cultural humility. And then it works to ensure research rigor and validity while also seeking to broaden the bandwidth of validity. So again, giving us that deeper, richer scientific understanding, um, and which means that how we think of validity also changes. Um, so again, I love those three. Now, so what is at the core of engaged research? Relationships, I said that before, right? I said relationships are important and I'll say it again. Um, they're so, so critical. These are two community partners um, that I've been working with for a very long time and I wouldn't be doing this without them. And here's a large group of us. All three of us are embedded somewhere in this photo. <laughs> and, um, and this is a much larger group from the Tribal Early Childhood Research Center. And we are all a part of making decisions. We're all a part of continuing that work. And so it's really how we think about recognizing and representing decision-making power and voice when we are engaging in research with our communities. Um, at the heart of this uh, work are partnership agreements, and these are really, really important. So everyone has the same understanding of what you are doing together. Um, it needs to state, these are kind of the basic things that need to be stated in any partnership agreement. Um, project goals and research questions, data issues around data sovereignty, rights and roles and responsibilities. So who's doing what and who has responsibility or voice? Responsibility can be another word for voice in each part of the process. And then how do you address differences in perspectives? Those are all really important things that should be addressed in any agreement as you're working with community. One way that we can support having those kinds of conversations with community before you get to the point of developing your agreement. So when you're coming to terms to, you know, to those agreed upon terms, the degree of collaboration advocacy tool can be really, really useful. Um, my colleague Diane and Sherry have worked to um, describe this in an article, which you can find referenced here. But the advocacy tool is pretty simple. The sides represent community partner voice and research partner voice. And you can make this more complex if you want. We won't do that just yet. The, the rungs represent the steps in that research process, which of course are gonna differ depending on the type of research or scholarly activity that you're doing. Those beads indicate power, voice, and commitment in the process. And this is just an example of an abacus that's been completed. I have crossed out develop instrument process and collect data because those are clearly not things that you do when you're um, analyzing secondary data. Um, so, but this is what it would kind of look like. And so here you have the community side and here you have the research side and how are you sharing, again, power, commitment, 
voice and responsibility in this process along the way for each, again, kind of component or phase of your research process. And so this is a nice tool to have these conversations about. So am I coming up with the community issue and assets that we're examining, or is my community partner doing that? And for the most, um, most of the time in our work, our community partners are actually the ones who are identifying the community issues and assets that need to be addressed. And, and you know, we as researchers are a part of that process, but we're really, the community's taking the lead. And when it comes down to deciding on those research questions, we're really sharing in that responsibility. We as researchers are helping to make sure that those research questions are framed in a way that they are answerable. Um, our community partners are really driving what is embedded within those questions. And so it's a true collaboration with shared power on those. And you can go down. What we tend to see for analyzing data is that, which is really important for these secondary data sets, is that usually it's all uh, the researchers who are analyzing the data. But I always like to advocate for just moving a bead, even just move one bead over so that our um, community partners are involved in that process. Again, it needs to be something agreed upon by community partners and researchers uh, so that the community partners have a say. Maybe they don't want to have anything to do with analyzing the data, but maybe they want to be involved in understanding in the process as you go. And that is where I would say that one bead moves over. If you move two beads over, then you're truly sharing in that responsibility of analyzing data and you're kind of co-analyzing data together. Um, with a data set like this, it's, this is a much more um, realistic way to move that bead over. And it certainly is possible. Um, so how do we foster cultural sensitivity and partnerships? And um, here we're talking about, there are two really critical components of this, cultural understanding and cultural humility, which we've already talked about cultural humility. When we move toward cultural understanding, we really wanna emphasize the importance of reflecting on our experiences. And some of this is gonna resonate with other things that we've already talked about. Um, but reflecting on experiences with diversity to demonstrate knowledge and sensitivity. And we're demonstrating our awareness of how diversity emerges both within and across cultures. Cultural humility is one of the most beautiful things that I think has emerged in the literature around community-based participatory research. Um, and it's not just in CBPR. Obviously, this is a term that has really come into its own um, in many, many areas, which is so wonderful. Again, I love the way it's applied in CBPR. So here's a quote um, by Murray Garcia from 1998 about cultural humility. Although none of us can truly become competent in another's culture, we should approach cross-cultural research situations with cultural humility, a humble attitude characterized by reflection on our own biases and sources of invisible privilege, an openness to the culture and reality of others, and a willingness to listen and continually learn. That willingness to listen and continually learn is critical. Um, so as we move forward, always consider how we apply cultural understandings and cultural humility within our partnerships. And there's a wonderful resource that I wanna to point to. I won't go through all of this, but it's a super great resource. And I'm sure Michelle can add this in, but it is in the PowerPoint. Um, there's a, a link to get to it, um, the tribal roadmap, which some colleagues of ours have, um, have described. And this is really a roadmap. Um, it, it's more about evaluation, but I think it's beautiful to apply this to research. And it's about understanding the importance of the journey and how we journey together. Um, it's about understanding the importance of our values and how we apply those values in the research or evaluation process as we move forward. Thanks for posting that, Michelle. As we move forward, we need to make sure that when we are working together with our partners, that we as researchers are 
asking questions and listening. So I love this, this little box right here. I should have made that really bigger because it's so important. Make no assumptions. Go in with your glass half empty. For our community partners, we want them to be open to sharing their experiences and perspectives. We want them to also make no assumptions, but we want them to go in with the idea that their glass is half full, right? Because we want them coming in feeling like they have something to add and we need to listen as researchers. Um, so that's, and obviously we need to be very aware of our cultural position and these two boxes here. What is your own level of cultural understanding? What is your own level of cultural humility? and understand that as we move forward. And I believe, whoo, whoo, I think, did I make it on time? Did I do that on on the nose. Awesome, yay. I'm sorry, that was a lot of information in a short period <laughs> of time, I apologize. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted, Michelle, I don't hear you. I always mute my phone and Zoom, and then I forget. I'm sorry about that. I don't know if you two, Jessica and Sarah, want to move right on to your next presentation, or if you have, want to take any comments or questions. I put in the chat. Um, I personally, everything that you are presenting, Jessica, I, I really think of it as sort of these, this luggage or this baggage that I'm carrying, and, and I carry the weight of history. Um, as a researcher, I'm also a tribal member, but I'm a researcher and that's how people see me. And I, I carry the weight of these things that have, that I may have had no personal part in, but are part of my uh, professional, I guess, legacy that I've stepped into and that I bring into the research space um, with me and in partnership. And so that video you shared from Havasupai was so so powerful. There were just some really, really moving quotes in there from people and their experience of having research done to them that they did not agree to. Um, but then I also think of what do I need to, what's missing from my bags? What's not in my luggage that I, that I need to put in there in terms of deepening my understanding of culture and context, as well as just some of these tools that you shared. Um, so I take no credit for what Dr. Barnes Major just shared here. Um, and I uh, just wanna thank you for, for setting us all up with all of this rich information. Thanks, Michelle, I appreciate that. But you should take some credit because <laughs> there's, there's so much of it that we've all done together. <laughs> Any comments or questions before we move on? There's been some chat just, you know, appreciating the information. I appreciate all the chat. Thank you all. I've been reading it as we go, and it's been wonderful to see. Hey, this is Susan. I have a comment um, or a question that maybe could be addressed later in the next session, but um, Jessica, you gave some really good um, framing for how to involve community in your, the research process. I'm wondering if maybe in the next session, you might give an example with secondary data analysis of like implementing, like what's one an example of implementing that? Exactly, great, thank you. That's exactly what we're gonna do. And in fact, we're gonna give an example specifically from AN Faces 2015. So thank you, That's, that is the plan. <laughs> And um, another question I guess I have for Michelle or for all Michelle, Sarah, Jessica, I know in the next, we have a lot